thank you for coming. It's great to see the room full. Um, the students, the parents, the grandparents, and our members and guests, welcome. I'm Ginny Richmond, if you don't know me, uh, the president of this wonderful, growing organization. Um, and I say that because this year, we've been really trying to get new members. So this year, we got about 50 new memberships, wow. which brings us up to about 280 at the moment. So if you are not a member, there are many, many application forms back there. <laughs> well, it's 10 bucks, okay? Uh, just so you know. I'll tell you a little bit about some of the major things that the museum has been involved in during the year 2006. We did get an additional state grant to uh, restore the Woolly House. Is there anybody here who does not know what the Woolly House is? Okay, we have one person. Anybody else? Two, all right. All right, let me just quickly, before they tell me to, that I talk too much, okay? Which they do. Um, the Woolly House is a 250-year-old homestead that uh, was moved about 1,000 feet to Joe Pelea Park, which the town owns. The town owns this house now, and excuse me, um, we're trying to restore it, and it will become a museum eventually for Ocean Township, and also we're inviting some of the surrounding communities to exhibit in it from time to time. Our town here, our mayor and council, is firmly behind this project. We couldn't do it without them, that's for sure. Uh, and they are not, we did not want to tear the house down. They didn't want to do it either, so it's being saved. We're trying to raise about a million dollars, and we've done it about a quarter of a million at this point, I would say, and it's being restored. Uh, so that's where we are. Uh, while I'm talking about the house, I will say that it got moved last year. It's now being secured for the winter. The township has put in the utilities. We've been working on the outside because, uh, as most of you know, it was very rotten. Everything was falling apart. The sills all had to be replaced. All that's been done. Uh, it's been uh, shored up underneath because it needed that. Because if you go there to our next exhibit, maybe, or the one after that, I can't tell you when we'll be in the room, in the house. Um, it has to be strong enough. Um, we have just now had the house uh, power washed. I believe the volunteer who did that is here. David, are you here? He was, yes, and thank you very much. That's what we're looking for, people. People like David who volunteer for us. Um, and then we had it uh, scraped a couple of times, three times, I think, and finally painted. And it's looking absolutely great. Uh, everyone is very, very pleased with it at this point. Um, however, we haven't done much on the inside yet. And the inside needs everything. So that's where we are. We're looking for money. We're looking for volunteers and any kind of help we can get. Um, and that is about what I'll say about the house right now. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's always a thrill to build it and see that they come. <laughs> the bad news is that it takes us almost 10 months to put together an exhibit that lasts a little more than 10 hours. So hopefully, every year I've said this, I've said this for the last three years, this will be the last time we have an exhibit in this room, which would mean that we could put it up and it would stay for weeks. And, you know, it would, maybe we're thinking maybe four different exhibits a year. Um, before I tell you a little bit about the exhibit and before we invite the children to come on to uh, interpret the exhibit for us, I wanted to acknowledge the people who have been so helpful and hardworking for these 10 months on the committee. Toby Cotchell, Joe L. Leon, Ginny, Cheryl and Bob Miller, stand up so that they can stand up. Celeste Jones, I don't think Celeste is here. Frank West, uh, Kathy Peratt, uh, Ted Dellinger, and Bobby Speck, and lots of other folks, and the wonderful people who have gone into their attics, into their great their grandmother's uh, hope chests, and taken out heirlooms and collectibles and shared with us, because we put it together kind of with magic. And as you noticed, 
Don't all exhale at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Or we'll have the domino effect. <laughs> when I heard the winds were going to be 60 miles an hour, I didn't <laughs> So I, we're going to have the, children, the, the students come in in just a minute, but I wanted to just take a minute and give you a little bit of an overview of the exhibit so that when the program is over, you might take uh, the time to walk through and appreciate and enjoy it, and maybe a little narration would give you some uh, orientation. Down here in this room, what we do is interpret the decade, the Roaring Twenties, on the national scene, because as enamored as we are of Ocean Township, there really isn't enough history in one decade in Ocean Township to do a full exhibit. So we kind of set the stage by telling the story of what was going on in the country and even globally uh, during the Roaring Twenties. So over here we have a timeline, and the timeline starts with, with 1920 and goes through 1929, and that's there to give you kind of the, the panoramic sweep, because if you'll remember, the 20s started right after the, the end of World War I, which was the world's most bloody conflict up to that time. It also came right after the flu pandemic of 1918 and 1919, an estimated 20 to 40 million people were killed in that. So two decimating world uh, global events that kind of started us off into this decade we call the Roaring Twenties. Two particularly significant constitutional amendments kind of set the tone for the decade. The first was the 18th Amendment, also called the Volstead Act, and it prohibited the sale, manufacture, and transportation of alcohol. Interestingly, it didn't prohibit the purchase or consumption. <laughs> we set up a very interesting dynamic because, guess what? People didn't stop drinking, which made most people, or at least those people who drank, and we assume from the materials we have that that was a considerable part of the population, were drinking. They therefore were violating the law or dealing with people who were violating the law. And it kind of shifted Americans' attitude toward the law and it kind of broke open a very freewheeling, very uh, partying, fun-loving decade. The second thing significant to half the people in the room particularly was the 19th Amendment, which gave women the, the right to vote. So it's like, it's, it's, it's inconceivable to me that my mother was not able to vote. And uh, I just always like to remind women of how hard our uh, foremothers fought for our right to vote and never ever let an election go by without taking advantage of that privilege. So that's the timeline. And then what we do for the rest of the table is go through themes of the 20s. So over here we have arts and entertainment. You'll notice when you come by that some very important things happen that help shape the decade. Commercial radio was, was established in the 20s. This is a big deal because all of a sudden people who had no access to what was going on in the world except the newspaper became ear witnesses to history. And so there was an involvement and an awareness of what was going on in the world. There was a drawing in of rural America, which was basically so isolated that it didn't necessarily have a part, feel a part of what was going on. You had the movies, of course, the start of the talkies. You had this highly glamorous age of Louise Brooks and uh, you know the, the whole Norma Desmond kind of thing that was going on there. Uh, the beginning of recorded music on a commercial basis, and, you, and we have some artifacts from that uh, as well. In the 20s, we had some outstanding sports figures. Babe Ruth joined the Yankees in the 20s, for example, so you can learn about that there. We move on here to what is probably the signature of the 20s, which is the flapper look. And I would just remind you that the 20s are coming out of the Victorian age, where the woman's ideal was this highly corseted hourglass figure covered to the neck, covered to the sleeve, <laughs> skirted to the floor. And this is what I decided when I, was, when I was putting this together. World War II, the men put down their guns and the women stuck to theirs. <laughs> During the war, right, the women, just like in World War II, had taken over and worked in the factories, handled the families, handled the job, just took care of things. So the men come back they were not about to be put back in their place, right? They had the vote, 
And so they weren't about to go back into their corseted Victorian gowns. So the flapper look replaced that hourglass figure. The woman's ideal was a very slim, boyish figure. All of a sudden, arms were bared, legs were bared. Fabrics became very elaborate. We have some magnificent examples here of the, of the highly intricate handwork, this gorgeous wedding gown. Um, and you can enjoy all of this. I mean, flappers were wild and crazy women. They drank, they smoked, they danced. <laughs> you know, they needed short skirts because they did the Charleston, and they used to kick up their heels. They, they not only rode in automobiles, they drove automobiles. And again, automobiles just, just made a huge difference in the freedom of American youth. You know, they were all of a sudden able to get places and, and connect to places. And of course, prohibition. The idea that people didn't stop drinking, just, it's very interesting because New Jersey was one of three states that did not vote for the ratification of the 18th Amendment. And the governor of New Jersey said, I vow to keep New Jersey as wet as the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> so nobody, so the law enforcement in New Jersey really turned a blind eye to any violations of the Volstead Act. So any enforcement that was done in New Jersey, by and large, was done by federal agents. And the federal agents were busy in Chicago, like Elliot Ness, and in, in Tennessee, in, in Kentucky. And you had rum runners going up and down from the Caribbean to Canada. Uh, mooring off of the coast of New Jersey outside the limit, and then you had s s speedy small boats going out from the shore. And they could outrun the Coast Guard, and the big boats were outside the limits, and so it was kind of like freewheeling. So when you go upstairs, what we have upstairs is an interpretation of the 20s in Ocean Township. And we boasted seven of the area's most popular speakeasies. <laughs> and a lot, of those were, uh, a lot of those were supplied by those small boats that came in through Deal Lake. The flume in Deal Lake was actually installed in the 20s. But, and then the, the, uh, even along uh, North Ed South Edgemere, there are still the steps where the bootleggers would bring, bring the, the booze up. One of the houses on North Edgemere, the, the Cinderella Room, please take a look at that up there, was a tea room. Not really. <laughs> and the ladies would go by their drivers to the tea room because they were too swacked to drive themselves. <laughs> <home>. <laughs> So read about prohibition, politics, an interesting decade in politics. We had three Republican presidents, all of them lackluster. The first was Harding. The only thing he had going for him was his good looks. He makes everybody's top ten list of the worst presidents. On, on many, he's, he is the worst. And we have a, a local connection here because he had a mistress who had an illegitimate daughter, and she was housed in Asbury Park, away from New York City, where she wouldn't be recognized. We have a birth certificate with all the scandalous details. So, I help you. <laughs> so after Har Harding died in office, you know, he, was, he came in in twenty, died in twenty three. Some say at the hand of his wife. <laughs> Didn't hear it from me. <laughs> so uh, his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, became president, sworn in by his dad, who was visiting his home, family home in, in Vermont. The call came in. His father, who was a justice of the peace, swore him in. In the middle of the night, he became the successor to Harding. And his most a uh, vivid claim to fame is that he slept through his presidency. I think he took a three-hour nap every afternoon. <laughs> and then uh, Hoover, Hoover, Hoover ran against Al Smith, which was kind of a turning point in American politics, because Al Smith was a city guy and a Catholic, a New Yorker, right? So he didn't win, but he really did a lot to kind of shift, shift things in it politically in the country. And, and Hoover kind of gets a bad rap because he couldn't do anything to stem this tide, tide of the Depression. But he, he actually tried, but was unsuccessful. And then, of course, the Scopes trial. I mean, it's like one of the things about doing these exhibits is how much things don't change. The Scopes trial was, was the, putting someone on trial in Tennessee for teaching evolution. And then over here, we have some of the, the uh, breakthroughs in technology and industry, most, most notably the electrification of the country and the connection of the country through the telephone grid. Not that electricity and telephone were, were discovered or invented then, but that was when the infrastructure was built that really tied the country together and changed everything. And of course, the stock market crash. 
And so that will kind of tell you the story, and then as you go upstairs and you read what was going on here, you can put it in that context of what the folks who lived in Ocean Township in the 20s uh, were experiencing on the national scene. So thank you very much for coming. I hope you take a few minutes to enjoy the exhibit. And now we all have the pleasure of um, enjoying the Intermediate School Forensic Club's interpretation of everything that I've just talked about. And I would like to introduce their coach. Their, their, what did you put him out? I didn't and it wasn't your name, I forgot it was your title. <laughs> 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 I just called a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, you know, there, there are nervous wrecks back there. Mm -hmm. And Trudy Wolf Larkin, who does this every year and was uh, formerly the forensics uh, advisor uh, before. She retired from that job to spend more time with uh, the mayor. Um, <laughs> so I took over. Uh, she's been doing this for years. She wrote everything that you're about to hear, uh, but she did not write anything for me to say to do this. So, uh, <laughs> Trudy couldn't be here tonight. Last week she had foot surgery. Uh, yesterday she had oral surgery, so right now she's having trouble walking and talking. Uh, <laughs> but I know Bill is eternally grateful for that. Uh, so. Uh, just a few things about the exhibits, because uh, what Ms. Stellinger just said. You notice over there, I noticed that in 1928, chewing gum was invented in 1928, and as a teacher, we're eternally grateful for whoever did that. Uh, <laughs> and mentioning the presidents, uh, Calvin Coolidge, uh, as she mentioned, his claim to fame, sleeping three hours every afternoon, taking a long nap. Uh, Calvin was known for doing not much of anything. And there's a little note up here, one of the famous stories about Calvin Coolidge was when this lady came to the White House and she bet somebody that um, she could get him to talk and she finally met him and she said, President Coolidge, I just made a bet I could make you say more than three words and his reply was, you lose. <laughs> and, and then when Calvin Coolidge died, the story, Dorothy Parker, who some of you might have known personally, uh, was having a tea party. And Dorothy Parker was famous for tea parties. And somebody came into the tea party and said, did you hear uh, President Coolidge just died? And her reply was, how could they tell? <laughs> so without further ado, we have um, five outstanding young students. Now, less than three weeks ago, they were competing at Rumson Country Day uh, in a forensic competition. So they've done... This, in the last, I'd say, two and a half weeks, like a, a Mr. Wolf Rockin wrote uh, the scripts. Uh, they've memorized it. Uh, you're going to enjoy it, I think. Uh, they're going to enjoy doing it. You're going to enjoy doing it. <laughs> uh, and uh, without further ado, we'll introduce Catherine Huggins. of Ocean Speakeasy, located right here in the back room of Catherine Huggins, that's me, fine house here on Monmouth Road. Now don't breathe a word of where you were tonight, or this establishment could be raided. I'll tell you what, if all of a sudden I do this, drop your drink under the table and begin to engage in animated talking, and pretend to be totally engrossed in an exhibit of, say, a historical museum somewhere in town. <laughs> when I put my hands down, you can resume your normal activities. Has everyone got it? <laughs> okay, let's practice. <laughs> All right then, that'll be perfect. I don't think anyone will bother us tonight though. Now that I have you all here on my speakeasy, there are some fascinating people visiting with us tonight that I'd like you to meet. These individuals are all everyday people who are willing to speak with us about their lives. All of them have distinguished themselves in some aspect of this decade. Now you might be asking yourself, how can we objectively view a decade when it's only December of 1929? But let me tell you, with the stock market crash only last month, we've developed a tiny degree of objectivity when it comes to what preceded the crash, as well as the events that have shaped the last 10 years. I'll let our guests tell you about the 1920s from their perspective. Our first guest this evening is Professor Jonathan Leder, who is a sociologist currently teaching at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Professor 
Professor Leader, welcome. Well, I thank you for the kind introduction, Catherine. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jonathan Leader, and I study people and their behavior. In the past decade, I have been investigating the rise in consumer society. And in the past 10 years, the comforts that have been afforded by the American consumer are staggering in their scope. Why, I actually heard the first commercial radio broadcast on Pittsburgh station KDKA in November of 1920. My wife, Martha, who had to wash the children's clothing with a washboard and basin, now has a machine to achieve this task. Also, she would have to keep the icebox stocked with ice to keep our milk cold. She now has purchased a refrigerator to keep these foods colder for a much longer period of time. Trust me, I won't miss lugging those heavy ice blocks up anymore. <laughs> By 1929, two-thirds of all American households had electricity. With the rise in demand in electricity, more inventions soon followed, such as the vacuum cleaner and the toaster. I think that because of all the conveniences, my wife's work around the home has decreased. She isn't convinced, however. She claims that because of all these conveniences, her work has actually increased. I don't know. <laughs> the automobile gave the American family more freedom to move about the air. They could easily go on Sunday afternoon trips, picnics, and other family excursions. On a Sunday afternoon, it wasn't uncommon for Martha and me to pack our kids in the bottle in the bat of, excuse me, back of our Model T Ford and go for a lovely drive. Of course. Everybody else who had a car had the exact same idea. By 1929, Americans spent an estimated $30 million on cars. So as you can imagine, the roadways were now crowded. So naturally, <coughs> motels, small hotels along the roadside, as well as many other restaurants, began popping up. Martha thinks it's outrageous behavior. Also, since I bought the car, our, church, our attendance at church has been curtailed dramatically. <laughs> she isn't happy about that at all. <laughs> Let's see. What else was different? Oh yeah, After the great, during the Great War, the government imposed standard clothing sizes on all garment industries. After the war, this meant that clothing could be mass produced. My wife didn't have to sell the children's clothing anymore. She could, if she had the time to, go to an apartment store maybe that lovely Steinbach's downtown, and purchase a dress as opposed to making one herself or going to a dressmaker. She's very happy about that. In, 19, in the decade, businesses began to change the way they operated. To stimulate sales and increase profits, they began advertising. The first million dollar campaign for You Need a Biscuits opened the eyes of all Americans on how influential advertising can be. By this time, these companies spend an estimated $3 million annually to advertise their products. Installment credit rose in the 1920s. Banks offered mortgages to customers while manufacturers allowed these customers to pay on time. About 60% of all furniture sales and 75% of all radio sales were purchased using this plan. When, Victor when Victorian society used to thrift on saving, they now celebrate spending and borrowing. Well, I think I've gone on long enough. I need to find my wife somewhere here in the crowd. Thank you, and have a good evening. <laughs> Americans spent $30 million a year on cars. Gee whiz, that's a lot of money. Now, let's see who else we can speak to this evening. Oh, I see my good friend Margaret Palmer. You'll just love her. She's a real free thinker. Let's bring her over. Margaret, how have you been? It's so nice to see you. It's wonderful to see you too, Catherine. Margaret, would you be kind enough to speak to our guest this evening about the work you've been involved in over the past decade regarding women's rights? I'd be happy to, Catherine. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am so pleased and proud to discuss the progress that the women's rights have made in the last 10 years. However, we must all pay a huge debt of gratitude to the thousands of women who came before us who spearheaded the suffragette movement for the last 72 years. Had it not been for the work of Susan B. Anthony, Dr. Alice Paul, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, among many, many others. All women in this country would not be able to enjoy the most important event of 1920s and this century, 
the passing of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, giving women the right to vote. And what a proud moment that was, too. It was a bright, clear, sunny day when I cast my first vote that Tuesday in November, a milestone in my life, to be sure. Of course, many of us had hoped that a proposed Equal Rights Amendment would also be passed, outlawing discrimination based on sex. Sadly, this issue has divided us, and it seems highly unlikely that it will pass in the next few years. Even with the vote firmly accepted by a constitutional amendment, the women's movement faced fierce opposition from outside forces. During the Red Scare after the Great War, the War Department tried to link feminist groups to foreign radicalism. A ridiculous notion, I know. And as a result, many of our goals went down in defeat in the 1920s. Opposition from many southern states and the Catholic Church obliterated a proposed constitutional amendment which would have banned child labor in this country. The plight of children today is deplorable, as I'm sure you are all aware. Children, babies really, as young as five or six, are working in factories and mines with no laws to protect them. We're working towards the elimination of this hard practice. It won't be long now, I pray. The horrendous working conditions some of our sisters must endure have been written about in the press. The horrific tragedy of the, in 1911 of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in the Lower East Side of New York City killed 146 young women, all under the age of 23. These poor souls perished because of improper exits, entrapping them in a blazing inferno. Since then, legislation has been moving in the area of improving the conditions of the sweatshops in this country. The Supreme Court has struck down a minimum wage for women workers, and Congress has failed to fund our health care clinics. We may have been defeated in the courts, but we persevered. Life for a working woman in the 1920s has not been easy. We haven't won any new opportunities in the workplace. In 1920, the American workforce was comprised of 8 million women. More than half were black or foreign born. The largest occupation was domestic service, followed by secretaries, typists, and clerks. As you know, all low paying jobs. Female professionals made very little progress and consistently received lower salaries than their male counterparts. Many of these professionals are concentrated in traditionally female occupations, like teaching and nursing. I hope that one day this will change, but for now, there are pitifully few women in traditional male jobs. I am sad to report that the major thrust of the organized women's movement has declined in the 1920s as a result of the rising consumer culture. By the introduction of modern conveniences in the home, the suffragettes of the progressive movement have seem out of place and somewhat old-fashioned as compared with the modern women of the 20s. Advertisers have tried too hard to convince the American public that the 1920s have exciting and liberating opportunities for women. They have even gone as far as parading down New York's Fifth Avenue to popularize smoking by calling cigar cigarettes torches of freedom. <laughs> Preposterous! I fear it will be decades before women are truly emancipated from the yoke of domestic duty where we can fully seek equal opportunities in the workplace. I hope that one day my granddaughter or granddaughter or great-granddaughter can elect to pursue a career outside of the home where she can fully compete with men in the workplace. I know in my heart that this will occur.
prevailing opinion in this country was that alcoholism was being promoted by the sale and manufacture of alcohol products. Honestly, ladies and gentlemen, my business didn't really suffer at all. Since alcohol was banned from sale, I allowed my customers the privilege of storing their alcohol in containers in my cellar. <laughs> Until that time, after their meal, and voila, a cup of coffee containing their special brew would appear at the table. This tactic wasn't especially clever on my part, but we worked within the system, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Between you and me, this prohibition business is a sham. I personally believe it was a twofold issue. One, it was a conflict between the United States brewers and their association with Germany during the Great War. Companies like Schlitz, Pabst, and Blatz practically screamed their national origin before the American public. As a result, officials wanted to punish them in some manner. Also, temperance battles between the Anti-Saloon League and National Temperance Council lobbied heavily to enact prohibition laws. What we had then were what we called wet and dry states. As a wet state, New Jersey was allowed to sell and transport alcohol, but only within the state itself. Dry states did not allow the sale of alcohol. The Reed Amendment made it a $1,000 fine for transporting liquor into a dry state. This amendment was completely ineffective, but it gave Congress a new awareness. They thought, maybe we could regulate the consumption of alcohol. Throughout the early part of the century, the battle raged on between the wets and the dries, with greater acceptance of temperance followers. By 1913, more than 50% of the U.S. population was under prohibition. It wasn't difficult to see the handwriting on the wall. From then on, it took one year and eight days for the 18th Amendment to guarantee ratification. I am proud to say that by the end of February of 1919, there were only three remaining holdouts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Jersey. The early days of prohibition brought with it an increase in alcohol-related crime. For instance, in the three months before the 18th Amendment went into effect, half a million dollars worth of alcohol was stolen from government warehouses. <laughs> By midsummer of 1920, federal courts in Chicago had to contend with over 600 liquor violation trials. Bootlegging, or the illegal trafficking of alcohol, increased in volume throughout the 1920s. For instance, in 1921, 95,933 illicit distilleries, stills, stillworks, and fermentators were seized. This number increased each year, until this year, when the number reached 280,000. But the law couldn't stop the demand for alcohol products. So when legal avenues could no longer meet the demand, illegal traffic began. The speakeasy placed the saloon. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, where we are now. People in this area alone have gone to extravagant means to find the elusive drink. Demand for wine for sacramental purposes increased from 2 million gallons in 1922 to almost 3 million gallons in 1924. That would account for all the record-breaking attendance at church and synagogue, don't you think? <laughs> Of course, there is no way to tell what the legitimate consumption of fermented sacramental wine is, but you can be sure that it doesn't increase 800,000 gallons in two years. <laughs> what is sad about the entire Prohibition Amendment is that it did nothing to eliminate alcoholism in this country. In fact, what it did do was to increase the number of young people who began drinking at younger and younger ages. Sadly, the 18th Amendment seems doomed to failure. Our next guest this evening is a lovely young lady who I see motioning to me now. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce Charlotte Roberts. It's so wonderful to see you, Catherine. It's been such a long time. I know. Charlotte, would you be willing to speak to our guest this evening about the 1920s in your life? Why, I'd be happy to, Catherine. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very excited to be able to speak with you tonight. It was characteristic of the Jazz Age, wrote novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald, that it had no interest in politics at all. Then what were we Americans interested in? Entertainment was Fitzgerald's answer, and I couldn't agree with him more. <coughs> After the Great War, Americans became more content with frivolous activities, and nothing could be more frivolous than going to see a movie, listening to some jazz, or dancing the Charleston. This is my decade. I've loved every part of the 1920s. 
let me tell you a little bit of what I've enjoyed for the better part of 10 years. American culture really exploded during the 1920s. The record chart, the book club, the radio, the talking picture, and spectator sports all became popular forms of mass entertainment. To me, the 1920s stand out as the decade that produced a generation of musicians, artists, and writers who are, in my opinion, <coughs> our country's most talented and creative. Not only was F. Scott Fitzgerald a leading literary force in the 20s with his novels, but the 1920s also produced many great works of art and music as well. It was in the 1920s that Eugene O'Neill, our country's most talented dramatist, wrote his greatest plays, and that William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and Thomas Wolfe published their first novels. Poets in the 1920s, such as Hart Crane, E.E. E. Cummings, Counter Cullen, Langston Hughes, Edna St. Vincent Millay, and, and Wallace Stevens, experimented with innovations in punctuation, rhyming, and form. Artists, such as Joseph Stella, Georgia O'Keeffe, and Charles DeMuth, broke free from the traditional realist forms of art and created non-representational expressionist art forms. The 1920s also introduced America into the world of serious music, with the creation of over 50 symphony orchestras and three of our country's most prestigious conservatories, Juilliard, the Curtis Institution, and Eastman. The 20s also met our greatest classical composers, such as Aaron Copland and Charles Ives. George Gershwin created new compositions by combining jazz into musical compositions by symphonies and orchestras. And then there were the radios. The radios are one of my favorite parts of the 1920s. From $60 million in sales in 1922 to $426 million in 1929, our lives have been changed forever by this unique black box. On any given evening, the radio would broadcast news, entertainment, and advertisements to 10 million homes in the U.S. by 1929. The radio really made heroes no quickly than any, quicklier than any other media. When Charles Lindbergh, Lucky Lindy, flew across the Atlantic Ocean in May of 1927 from New York to Paris, he became an overnight hero. The ticker tape parade in his honor was momentous, with over 1,800 tons of confetti falling along the route. Let's see, what other noteworthy highlights were there this decade? Oh yes, the phonograph, my absolute favorite invention. The phonograph made piano sales fall as the record player replaced it. Blues, jazz, and hillbilly music just made the phonograph that much more popular. I just fell in love with jazz. Duke Ellington wrote the first jazz compositions, and Louis Armstrong invented scat for singing of nonsensical syllables. Benny Goodman made the Chicago School of Improvisation popular. Blues singers like Mamie Smith and Bessie Smith sang their poignant, sorrowful songs to a vast audience. Oh, and the movies. The movies are my favorite part. Well, next to the phonograph. The movies showed a slice of life that we can only dream about, featuring glamorous actresses like Greta Garbo and Clara Bow and those romantic movie idols like Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and, of course, Rudolph Valentino. I remember sitting in a darkened theater watching epic films like Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments with its cast of thousands and electrifying special effects. The movies popularized a 20s flapper with her bobbed hair and her short skirts. Americans also laughed a comedy starring Buster Keaton. Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin as the little tramp. And who can forget the day that the jazz singer opened? The first talking picture. The silence were over forever. The radio, the phonograph, and the motion picture all mirrored American mass culture, and the public went wild for them. I would be remiss if I didn't finish with a short discussion of spectator sports in the 1920s. As I said before, Americans were starved for heroes, and these sports figures fit the bill perfectly. Prize fighters like Jack Dempsey won the hearts of millions. Newt Rockne and his four horsemen at Notre Dame made following college football a popular pastime. Professional football became popular when, in 1925, Harold Red Grange attracted 68,000 fans to the Bolo Brooklyn Polo Grounds for a professional football game. Baseball became an even bigger sport than football did. 
even after the 1919 Chicago White Sox scandal, when the players admitted to throwing away a World Series, it had certainly seemed that baseball had taken a black eye. It took the skills of George Herman Babe Ruth, who became the true 1920s superstar, totally eclipsing Ty Cobb's terrific record. In 1921, this New York Yankee hit 59 home runs. In 1927, the Sultan of Swat hit 60 home runs. Now there's a record that may never be beat. Well, folks, that's my impression of the 1920s. These last 10 years have changed me, I know. I will carry the memories of this decade in my heart for the rest of my life. Thank you, Charlotte. That was fascinating. You really did encapsulate the decade for me. Where has the time gone? Our last guest this evening is a young man who I'm sure has much to tell about the financial scene in the 1920s. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce Mr. John Duvall, a former New York stockbroker. It's such a pleasure to be able to speak to all your guests tonight about my experiences for the past 10 years. Now folks, I don't know if Catherine told you what I did for a living, but I can assure you, I've had a pretty interesting life. And from my perspective, as an Ocean Township resident, Pretty trying one too. You see, once upon a time, I was a New York stockbroker. Oh, thank you. And a pretty successful one at that, mind you. Until this past October. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me instead just stop and tell you about the financial scene in the 1920s so you can get an idea of how precarious the economic community was and why we were so unprepared for the crash that eventually happened. The Great War. With it came a need for higher production, but at the same time, a labor shortage. So this basically meant that industries had to create new, more efficient ways of mass producing goods. Yet at the same time, old industries like steel and petroleum were being stimulated by the war. And it wasn't just that, because new industries, completely new ones, like rayon and plastics, were being invented for the war. So the end result was this. <laughs> By 1918, upwards $2.5 billion had gone into new industrial machinery. And folks, that was just the beginning. In, as the 1920s rolled around, Industries began to pour millions more dollars into scientific management and industrial research. <laughs> As the new scientific management and new technology helped workers increase their wages, they also became better consumers. This allowed a new business innovation to appear on the scene called the installment plan, which essentially allowed American consumers to buy the consumer goods of their dreams as long as they were willing to go into debt. <laughs> now, these dream consumer goods were some of the inventions that you folks have heard about tonight, such as the radio, the automobile industry, motion pictures, and just everyday electronic appliances. Now, the end result of this was that there was a closer relationship now between the business community and the consumer community. And on top of it all, Imaginative investors were being reborn as millionaires overnight because they were able to pinpoint which of these tiny little businesses were going to make it big and their stocks along with it. The end result is that business has been king in this decade, the 1920s. The American government supported big business by putting the highest tariffs on American, on non-American foreign goods. Meanwhile, Congress lowered the rates for personal and corporate income taxes. In fact, get this, American business leaders were actually exempt from paying taxes altogether, which means that they were making obscene fortunes off of untaxed dollars. Even though the FTC, that's Federal Trade Commission, was made to regulate big businesses, 
and try to prevent unfair business practices, well, the jurisdiction didn't really touch the stock market at all in the 1920s. And why would it? American elected officials from the president on down wanted big business to succeed and would do anything in their power to see that happen. And for the next few years, that's exactly what happened. You could say that the 1920s have been a boom decade. Investors who bought land in Florida were made millionaires because the land was great. And so prices went sky high. Then in 1926, two hurricanes ravaged the state. And all those prices that had gone up, they plummeted downwards because of the bubble burst effect that was caused by investor insecurity. Unfortunately, people didn't learn their lesson at all. You know, maybe if they had, we would have been able to prevent the worst effects of the crash. As it is, though, they didn't and we couldn't. In 1928 and 1929, the stock market buying spree was in full effect. The number of accounts in brokerage houses reached 1,555,000, but all of these, only about 950,000 were cash accounts in which the user paid every cent of the sale price. The other 600,000 of them were really speculative accounts, in which the user put in part of the sale price, but then they used the rest as from a loan from their broker. Now that broker would in turn borrow money from the bank, and then he would use the collateral, for collateral, the margin customer securities. Now, this is how the speculative cycle, as it was dubbed, worked. And it worked beautifully, don't get me wrong, until <laughs> stock prices didn't go up anymore. Because at that point, that was a big problem. By the middle of this year, 1929, the stock market was a mess. It was completely out of control. The number of stocks exchanged in the New York Stock Exchange went up from 449 million in 1926 to a whopping billion, no, more than a billion in 1929. That's just three years. Three years, and it went up by so much. The Radio Corporation of America, the symbol of the big bull market, the big business market, its stocks went up from $89 a stock in 1926 to $420 a stock in 1929. Looking back, it doesn't take much intelligence to figure out what happened. As stocks went up, the house of cards began to tip under its own weight because a single card began to shake the foundation. And that happened this past October. I was there on the exchange that happened on October 19th, 1929. It was a day that I'm probably never going to forget. Nowadays, people are calling it Black Thursday. For the last several days prior to that day, stocks had been going down in price because of the constant trading that had been happening. It was completely out of control. More and more margin calls were being put out, meaning that all those securities that the brokers were using as collateral, well, because the stocks had stopped going up, they weren't enough for collateral, which meant that they weren't able to supply the speculators, which made up a lot of the stock population. As more and more margin accounts had to be liquidated, more and more people became extremely worried, myself included. By the next Thursday, Wall Street was bedlam. Everything was a complete mess. Brokers were calling customers, and customers were calling brokers, crying, screaming, because they realized that all their stocks 
all of that that they had worked for had gone up in smoke. Or, as is more befitting of the situation, down in flames. <laughs> in retrospect, because I mean, we're all so brilliant in hindsight, it's pretty easy to see the different little factors that led to the stock market crash. It could have been the disproportionate distribution of wealth in this country. Because this past year, in 1929, 5% of all of the United States population brought in a third, one third of all personal income in the country. But that can be really alone. It can also have been our wobbly banking system, to say the least. Because if one bank failed, then that meant that severe repercussions could be felt throughout all the other banks. But even then, we could have made it up with foreign trade, couldn't we? Because a considerable amount of countries owed the United States large sums of money. We could have made it up with that, right? But no. Because those foreign tariffs that I mentioned before, well, they made that impossible. Instead, what the government did is that it validated funds that, when validated, actually hurt American investors more than it helped. But in the end, I have to conclude that the overall reason that so much damage was done was the government policy that prevented them. It was almost sinful for them to interfere in the economic and business community of the country. And that was really the appeal to most of the crash. I left the business world this past month. I now live in a nice house by the ocean here in New Jersey with my family. And I'm no longer a stockbroker. I now have a nice, comfortable job in Bell Labs that lets me repay all the damage that was done from the financial crash. But I know that a lot of people were not as lucky as me. And I feel really, really bad. I hope that the government in the future, hopefully the near future, will be able to take a stronger stand on this and help some of the people who were really hurt in the crash. But for now, there's really nothing that we can do. So, go in peace, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. Thank you. Couldn't be here tonight. This is uh, Trudy Wolf Park in New York. She's one of the most talented uh, teachers we have at the school, and she does a great job. Um, the only probably one mistake that I can think that she's made in her whole life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. Only kidding. Uh, and I like to bring out, uh, you know, as a teacher, I. I was fortunate enough to have all of those uh, students in class last year. And one of the nice things about being a teacher is that you get to know and uh, try to teach students like this. And it makes the job uh, so worthwhile. Uh, and we're all in the seventh grade. We only have one honors class. And we're all in the seventh grade honors uh, class that I teach. Uh, and they all did an excellent job, except well, Marcus, I will mention. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but let me bring back out Catherine Ripley. Uh, Jordan 
Yeah. 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 Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed that.